Sanya, how are you doing? Welcome back. Thank you, Al. It's so fun to kick this off with you. I'm doing great. Well, aside from my little bit scratchy voice, otherwise fabulous. <laughs> well, <laughs> how are I'm you? Hope, hope you're all right. I, I'm doing well and excited to engage in this new forum. And, you know, we have been talking over the past months and years, really, about how can we engage the community in a way where their voices can be heard and they can explore ideas with, with peers. So we have this idea share format, which frankly, we're not gonna go into detail today because we're just starting this out, but we wanna introduce the concept and we wanna do it around the theme of diversity, equity, and inclusion and how employee listening is a initiative that can help advance DEI uh initiatives mm -hmm. themselves so with that as a staging you know you're obviously in the employee listening employee experience <laughs> you know, business and, and when we talk about the getting voices heard can you just share your perspectives and ideas on the importance of listening in advancing dei initiatives <laughs> Absolutely. So actually, I'm, I'm coming off with a conversation that I just had in the previous hour with one of my dear friends and former colleagues. And she's a working mom and has been just this incredibly successful and fulfilled in her career. And I was joking because we were recording this podcast and I felt like it was a one on one session with me and her asking a bunch of advice. And I'm like, oh, well, but I'm like, I'm really hopeful that if I if these things are top of mind for me, um, that they're top of mind for a lot of people. And so I think we're, we live in such a unique time that, I mean, there's been so much opportunity to improve diversity, equity, inclusion over the years, but our working situation has changed so much. You know, whether we're, like I always mention, like I said in Buenos Aires, Argentina, my teams are all over the world. How do I engage? How do I really truly understand what the needs of my people are um, who might be very different profile than me, whether it's age or race or sexual orientation, whether they're a parent or not, whether they're a caregiver or not. Um, there's so many assumptions that we can make, and those are really dangerous because without asking, we can make some really big bets, but based on information that you know, it was just a guess at best. And if we have the right information, if we really understand the needs, we can be that much more effective, but it's nearly impossible to do that without asking. And so um, my colleague Anna and I have actually spent a ton of time over the last couple of weeks um, leading up to our Question Pro X day, like talking about what kind of impact can we make in this space of diversity and inclusion. It is so incredibly, incredibly complex but the gap is so enormous. So in some ways, there is this great opportunity um, that a big question is around focus. And again, like I keep saying, the best place to know where to focus is through having conversations, through asking people, um, through knowing what those needs are. And they could be very different um, in many different ways and very different also for people in, inside the organizations. But there are some really significant things that, you know, we can get started on, whether it's benefits, whether it's, you know, working situations and how much flexibility you give to people, et cetera. So it, on the one hand, and I was mentioning to you as you and I were preparing for this session, like it overwhelms me the amount of uh, work there's still left to do. But on the other hand, it really excites me because I think as, as as soon as we can put energy and effort towards it, it's a place that we can make real, real substantial difference. But what do you think? <laughs> this is I love I love this format because usually I'm talking with you and you're interviewing me about whatever subject matter expertise I bring to the table. But here we're peers. <laughs> so I can turn it over to you and say, well, what do you think? Like <laughs> Well, here, here. Let, let me. Um, before I answer that, hi, Brad. Thanks for being here. Super appreciate you. Um, and by the way, so everyone knows, I have a black eye, um, and I did it to myself. Uh, so there's no grandiose story there. Playing beach volleyball, I bonked myself. Um, so, so anyway, does Al have a black eye? I'm like looking at myself. Like, yeah, yeah, Weird shadow. So, um, so here's the thing about this format, this idea share format. Uh, if you are joining, you're likely familiar with Pafal Live, where we share use cases and research. It's a 30 minute, you know, quick, um, you know, snapshot. And yes, certain elements can be interactive. 
I have my podcast, which goes into stories of influencers and leaders and those who are impacting people analytics, workforce planning, employee experience, DEI, and of course, the future of work. This format is going to be an opportunity for us to join in small pods to share your ideas and perspectives on a topic of the day. And we're not going to do that today, um, but we want to introduce the concept and let you know that Sanya and I are going to be doing this on an ongoing basis, weekly, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And we'll see how that time goes. We might adjust mm -hmm. yeah, based on uh, the feedback that we learn from the community. But yes, we have all these perspectives and ideas on this theme and many other themes that are impacting the world. So I just want everyone to understand this is not just going to be Sanya now going back and forth and bantering <laughs> on a certain topic. We mm -hmm. want to create a forum mm -hmm. so you can share, you can listen, you can learn, you can, you can iterate. But we're going to set the stage on, on certain topics. So we'll yeah. only be going till um, the bottom of the hour today. But again, we want this to be a sample of what this will be. So let me say this. Um, there is so much innovation that is required not only that's happening, but that is required in the DEI space. And employee listening, when we first started talking about this, it was kind of a, a cute term that was replacing or substituting for employee service. Employee surveys, mm -hmm. no one wanted to do them, although they're too long, they're too frequent, survey fatigue, all this stuff. But how can we listen attentively and take appropriate action? Now, listening is not only about surveys now. We have this behavioral mm -hmm. data around how people are spending their time. Everything from organizational network analysis to having in Microsoft Viva, your former your workplace analytics, where you can actually see how many meetings you're having, how much time you're spending. So what do you do with that? And how do you put a DEI lens on top of it to understand that there might be disproportionate impacts on certain groups within your organization and how in turn do you take then you know a, a appropriate action so what i get both frustrated and excited is that dei initiatives are often separate from employee listening initiatives and they're brought together after the fact what i would love to see is a more proactive integrated approach where hey we have certain dei goals how are we going to measure them, not only through a survey, but through these behavioral metrics, particularly with hybrid work? And the last thing I'll say, and it's top of mind, uh, I had the privilege of talking with Rob Cross this morning about his work on collaboration overload and micro stressors and, and, and all these things. So how does that then relate? to yeah. you know, women in the workplace, to uh, minority mm -hmm. groups in, in the workplace, because the stressors that some people experience, might, other people might not experience and vice versa. So there's so much learning to be had, but there needs to be an integrated systematic approach. So again, both frustrated about where we are, but also mm -hmm. very excited for, for where we're heading. Yeah, that's, I, I totally agree with you. It's that when you're like, oh, the finish line's so far, but, now following all those philosophies that sometimes it's like, what's the progress that I made today? Um, how am I better than I was yesterday? Instead of like looking and saying, wow, I've still got a ways to go. Looking back and saying like, all right, we did something this week. Yeah. Let's maybe, you know, turn it up a little next week or let's keep the pace. But if we keep chipping away at it, it's better than, you know, what was done last year or the year before. Um, you know, you bring up organizational network analysis and I'm, I'm a huge fan. I've done a lot of work around that. And I think relationships are something that we somewhat recently started to talk about in the workplace, but I'm a really firm believer that a lot of like how much we enjoy our career, how much we enjoy our work, how well we adapt relationships are a huge driver of that. And of course, like a lot of organizational initiatives are going to be the foundation of it. But if you can find people around you that are going to support you, that are going to appreciate you, that are going to see you and have your best interests at heart, that is absolutely priceless. And so organizational network analysis helps with that 
tremendously to understand who's connecting with who and which way. Now, to your point, it's also like, what kind of data is it? Um, I think that meetings are really interesting. I used to, as you know, work with like more recognition data. And I love that too, because that to me was more that clear appreciation going above and beyond. It was, it got to more of an actual relationship and caring for someone than maybe just sharing a space in a meeting. But I think you start in different places and you start to piece all of those things together. And then of course, asking people like to, to your point, how do we measure what's our KPI? There's so many things that we can do in diversity and inclusion. Like the, the one thing that I've been following and I do like as a, as a base is the diversity numbers that organizations are pledging to that they're making more public, that they're tracking, but then also like that sentiment of how I might be the only woman in the room, but I might feel seen and I might feel appreciated. And that's, you know, a question pro, we're a technology company. We're still mostly male, but I probably, without getting emotional, will say I've never felt more seen and appreciated in my life. And it doesn't matter that I'm not surrounded by half women all the time. It doesn't matter that it's the relationship and that interaction. So Yes, is it more than likely if you're in a room with similar others that you won't feel uncomfortable, but it's not absolutely necessary. It's about those relationships. And that's why, and then, you know, the question is, well, why? Why do you feel like that, Sonia? Why do you feel like that to those individuals who do experience that in the workplace? And how do we replicate that? Is it how your leader positioned you? Is it the voice that somebody helps you get? Is it how much you fight for your own place like there are so many different variables but i do believe in many ways that there is a recipe so i do think that there's that combination between the the pure number but then also that sentiment that that number doesn't always give you because you could be one out of ten and you could feel like the most appreciated and visible person in there or you could be a one out of ten and you could feel like you could just curl up because nobody will hear your voice otherwise. Um, yeah. But having all those inputs, I think is really important. Yeah, it, like employee resource groups come to mind as you're sharing this and you know, how does, how do the learnings from those conversations actually get incorporated into listening programs and in turn uh, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, initiatives? I, I think there's a lot of loss, there's a lot of loss, there's a lot loss in the translation that we need to package. I think there's, uh, you know, I'm, you know, again, this is where I get really hopeful and, and, and really frustrated. And by the way, there are questions that are uh, down at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to provide your comments and answers to those questions in the comment section on the platform that you're on. We're live streaming on LinkedIn and YouTube and um, Facebook as well. By the way, I'm a little handicapped on the LinkedIn right now for whatever reason, I can't reply to the comments there, um, but I can see those comments and, and bring those up. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I want to share um, and encourage people to respond to is that if we have employee resource groups and by their very nature, there are these forums by which people can share and connect and draw energy and feel that they're not alone. If, however, they're, what they package and agree upon isn't elevated and asked about and hopefully positive change happens, it can actually be a disengager. So I would yeah. love to see, you know, as Brad Hubbard, who commented a minute ago, the integration with facilities, what's happening there, corporate affairs, communications, you know, the governance around all this and, and in effect connecting the dots, I think there's a lot room for um, improvement. So, you know, again, enter your uh, comments and questions to uh, these questions that we're, we're posing. So what I have for you, um, the question I have for you, uh, Sanya, is we talk about measuring the impact of DEI initiatives in organizations of large and small, because most of yeah. the use cases that are out there are for large enterprises. And I know you work with some large mm -hmm. enterprises, but also small to mid-sized you know, companies as well. So focusing on small to mid-sized companies for a minute, you know, how would you advocate a you know organization of 500,000, you know, get started mm -hmm. or maybe more accurately advance their DEI initiatives with employee listening? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think to your point, there's a lot of times we, we see resource challenges, um, not only resource, sometimes in the terms of technology, right? So like you would say, well, what's your, what's your diversity base or number today? And there could be organizations of that size that don't have an HR system right now. And they could say, you know what, I'm not, I'm actually not really sure. I don't know how, what our racial diversity is, what our gender diversity is. We haven't collected that. Um, sexual orientation, certainly don't know. Um, so even just getting that baseline. Now, of course, like a lot of times I'm biased because I work with surveys so much, but I think to me, that is an easy way to collect information from the people who are open to sharing that. But understanding if you're if you're going to quantify, like at least I want to have a diverse workforce, having, I know it sounds like maybe a little silly, but knowing what baseline you're starting with is really important because then you can give yourself some goals of you know what the growth is when you think about that growth you can look at labor market statistics and say a lot of times you know people will get stuck and say in a certain profession there are only so many women so it's really hard to you know i, I can't have 80 percent of women in technology if the market only has like you know 30 or 40 percent or so who are in there, but you can at least understand your baseline and decide what's important for you to work towards. And then also say, where are we going to have some balances? So there are certain professions that's really hard to find individuals in. Where can we compensate? And where can we make sure, okay, maybe this is really tough. Fit, labor market doesn't even have 50-50, so it'll be difficult for us to have it in the organization right away. But where are the areas where we can have a better age, gender, race, sexual orientation, et cetera, representation. But I think even more than that, it's also going back to your culture. And a lot of times looking at what your values are and saying, how do I tie, how do I define my KPIs, but what my values are? Because again, a lot of times we think about diversity and we think about the numbers in the representation. But to me, I think, like I was saying before, it's even more about the sentiment. It's not just about, um, who do I have inside the organization, but how are they actually experiencing my culture? And recently, um, Al, you and I were chatting with Marcus Sawyer and I was on a, a round table with him and it was a talent acquisition round table. And what I found fascinating is what Mark at, Marcus asked, this group of people focused on recruitment and talent acquisition, what's the biggest diversity challenge or diversity and inclusion challenge in your organization? They said retention. Mm. These are people who are in charge of hiring. That's like what they wake up and think about. But even they understood that, wait a minute, it doesn't matter who I can effectively sell a position to, who I can effectively sell the organization to. If they come in and this is not a place where they want to stay, it's going to be a revolving door. So until we actually create that effective retention, and to me, Retention is 100% tied to the promise that you're making to your employees through your mission, through your vision, through your values. And then how do you measure to make sure that when it comes to inclusion, that it comes to equity, then it comes to belonging, you're delivering on that promise and you're delivering to all groups equally. So that's where it starts. And that you get through the sentiment, that you get through engagement, that you get through looking at those meetings and saying who's involved where. Do we have equal representation and voice in some of the things that are most important in our organizations? Or are we somehow systematically selecting people and not realizing that in some ways we're discriminating against some groups? So I'm sorry, maybe you were looking for a lot more um, straightforward <laughs> answer. <laughs> You've no. known me long enough that it's going like, you know, to go in some kind of direction. No, because one of the goals of this forum and you can see the questions coming up. And again, we want to initiate discussion. And as we get um, more participants in the show, we want to have groups and we'll extend you know, for 45, 50 minutes or, or so. So we can actually go into what are called twines and we can spend eight to 10 minutes talking in small groups of three or four and then come back and, and share what we listened or what we learned and were able to share in those forums. So again, I want to give everyone who's participating or listening to the recording and understanding where we're going with, it, with this forum, this idea share forum. Um, DI, um, this is going to be a no shit statement, is complex. And it's also the case where it touch, touches a lot of processes. And there's a lot of analytical techniques uh, that can be employed. And one of them for me, and I skipped over a segue that you just prompted, 
is that organizational network analysis is something that historically has been around understanding uh, personas, you know, how to create, uh, to use Michael Arena's uh, term, adaptive space to facilitate innovation and uh, you know, understanding your role in, in this in the system. Um, all fantastic. It's also the case where it can shed light on how certain groups are either isolated or integrated. And I, I'm not going to share this organization, but um, I was taken aback, as was as people analytic leader, when they unpacked their DI numbers. Their DI numbers had actually improved significantly. However, mm -hmm. those people that were hired were hired into pockets of the organization. It wasn't actually an integration across the mm -hmm enterprise it was in pockets and to your point unsurprisingly the first year attrition uh, even the uh, two to three year attrition in those groups um, was higher than in other groups so you know there was a you know a problem so it's not only about hiring it's about <laughs> designing the organization and designing the experiences so people want to stick around and I asked this question, and we have a host of questions and more will come on this particular theme is does your DI um, partners, do they connect or work with their workforce planning uh, folks in, in the organization? Because you mentioned talent intelligence or talent market analytics. You know, if we're searching for talent and there's not that much talent in the pipeline or in the market, mm -hmm. you know, what are the realistic expectations to hire in those pools, you know, over time? So we have to be really mindful. Again, it can be complex. I see many organizations mm -hmm. get paralyzed with the complexity, but there are ways forward. And it takes, in my view, governance. It takes getting the people in the right room, the key stakeholders in the right in the room, and just having the yeah. discussion prioritizing and, and moving forward. So with that, you know, I know we got, let's say, a handful of minutes. Sandy, regarding not only this topic, but, you know, again, mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this, is that there's so many within our community who are capable to talk about this, not only from a use case perspective of what they've done in the mm -hmm. past, but they have ideas and perspectives on what others are doing, you know, in the space. Mm -hmm. So do you see as we embark on this new uh, format, you know, how, do, how does it resonate for you? I mean, why are you devoting your valuable time to developing this, uh, this form? Yeah, well, I, I love to learn. Um, I read a lot. I talk with people as much as I can, but I think there's so much value in connecting with people who are not necessarily in your immediate network. Um, why? Because we tend to create our immediate networks with kind of people who are similar to us, think similarly than us. It's not bad, but it might be somewhat limiting in getting like a really different idea or learning something that somebody tried that worked really well or learning somebody that somebody tried that really didn't work well and what did they get out of it. And so to me, this is a moment and I, I, I read, I mean, you and I have like our informal book club where we're like take screenshots of like, I'm reading this book, you have to read it. And you were talking about Rob Cross earlier. And I was like, I still like, he's in the back of my mind every time I'm thinking about like meetings and like, what do I attend? And, you know, muting social media, like the man like has like permanent residency in my brain. Um, but there's also so much value in having the real conversations like bringing people together about things that they're passionate about and really saying this is what i just did this is what i just worked on this is how i approached it this is who i did it with um i, I to me that's why i wanted to have that community because i want to get no get to know more people and have more ideas and i think that it's really going to be valuable across the board and i think partly why now for a lot of these issues is you and I have talked about we're in somewhat economic uncertainty to maybe say it very politically correctly. Um, we don't know where you know the year is necessarily going. I think a lot of us don't know what 2023 is going to look like. And so, for example, even my colleague Anna and I were talking about you know how do we make sure for people who have had DNI efforts in place that when resources get really tight, when priorities are very much competing, how do we continue to make that a priority? And I think a lot of times having that community 
and how having people with different ideas and different resources helps that because otherwise it can get really exhausting because this is a, a battle we've been fighting for a really long time. And I just don't like we saw all this information around how horribly tough the pandemic was on a lot of these initiatives. Let's not let our environment around us get us down again like that, where we have this big loss. Yeah. But I don't think we had this big loss because we wanted to. Of course, we didn't. We just it, it blindsided us and we didn't know what to do. Now we have if we have some anticipation to say, hey, hopefully things are going to be OK. But if not, how can we come together and really help each other to know how to push through in these important initiatives? I think that's so incredibly important. So that's why I'm here, because I have all this passion and like a lot of us limited resources and unfortunately still one brain that's sometimes tired more often than I'd like it to be. So I need help. <laughs> and if I can, I want to help others for anything that I've tried, anything I've heard, anything I've listened. I think we've just got to have each other's backs <laughs> to make this work. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And just uh, to highlight a couple points as we, we start to wrap. And by the way, Brad, thanks for being here. Thanks for adding mm -hmm. your comments. And I certainly amplify your point on uh, sentiment analysis and going through mm -hmm. comments and packaging those, communicating those. It's actually a great segue because in effect, we're doing something similar here. Mm -hmm. Is like, how can we get into a forum and share what we think about and feel about a, a, a certain topic um, we talk about book clubs. So one of my you know, favorite books now is 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals, which relates to collaboration overload, which re relates to micro stressors, which relates to Work Without Jaws by John Boudreaux. There's just so much that we can uh, share and explore with one another to not yeah. only our mutual value, but to the value of the community at large. So I hope you'll engage in this forum and you know, help it evolve so it's you know again valuable for um for everyone uh two more quick things uh stay tuned for updates um the uh there are going to be registrations for this so you can actually add your uh profile meaning size of organization your role your interest area so you can actually get paired up with people who have similar interests, similar uh, size organizations. So there's gonna be a uniqueness to that. And the other thing is if you have topics or books or articles that you would like us to feature and discuss, you know, let's let's talk about those. I mean, you and I are both you know huge Adam Grant fans and think again, you know, think like a scientist yeah. is obviously squarely in the people analytics, employee listening, workforce planning realm. So, you know, let's talk about it. How can we uh, create a data, I don't want to say data driven, <laughs> but data informed culture. Mm -hmm. So we can all make wiser decisions and be better at, at what we do. So as we start to close, Sanya, any um, inspirational words or ideas or things that you want to leave the audience with? No, I mean, just if you're here, thank you for being here. You're a part of this incredible community, like that will make a difference. And like Al was saying, like it is hard and we're going to be tackling big things, but also worth it. Um, so grateful even ahead of meeting a lot of you for your energy, for what you stand for, and just very much looking forward to, you know, closing out this year with some collectively big wins that we couldn't have imagined and just, you know, making 2023 um, a year to remember. So thank you for, thank you for joining us, becoming a part of this community and just really looking forward to incredible things ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Sanya. And again, thank you for all who participated today and uh, we'll be back next week. So come join. Yeah. Right. Thank you much. Be well. Thanks everybody. Take care.